Um, the reason we developed this exhibition, a little bit of background, is that 2009 was the anniversary of the Northern Party, which comprised Douglas Mawson, Alistair Mackay and Edgeworth David, Tanner Edgeworth David, um, planting the flag at the South Magnetic Pole. And there were lots of celebrations, including a flight over Antarctica that Charlie hosted. Um, so we thought it was a, an opportune time to examine this phenomenon. Um, we also begin by questioning whether they actually did get to the pole. Uh, no one's really ever explored this in an exhibition. There's, there's been lots of uh, exhibitions on um, the great sledging expeditions and, you know, Mawson's um, Far Eastern sledging expedition where he chopped his sledge in two, but this is the first time that story, this story has actually been unpacked. Um, thirdly, and most intriguing from my perspective, was uh, the significant role Australia seemed to play in the quest. Um, the great French, British and American expeditions of the late 1830s all wintered in Australian ports, including Sydney. Um, Australians Lewis Bernacki, Douglas Mawson, Edgeworth David, Robert Bage, Frank Hurley and indeed Charlie himself were key players, pole dancers if you like, in the 20th century search for the pole. Um, this fellow we see here is um, William Gilbert and in 1600 this English physician made a globe of lodestone, a torella it was called, uh, after, and of, after observing the effects of needles placed on it, concluded that the earth itself was a giant magnet. Its north pole attracted the south end of a magnetised needle and vice versa. He believed that the angle of inclination might be used to calculate latitude at sea and questioned the notion that a magical magnetic mountain or north star caused a compass needle to point northwards. Between 1683 and 1692, astronomer Edmund Halley, who you're probably familiar with, developed a theory on the variation of the compass, the difference between a compass bearing and true north. Halley's Earth comprised several shells nestled inside each other with their own atmospheres, life forms, and a total of four magnetic poles. And you can see him here holding his, um, his hollow Earth. In 1698, the king gave him the ship Paramore to see if the theory could be refined enough to determine the great navigational conundrum of longitude. Hollow Earth Haley, as he was later nicknamed, charted the variation of the compass in the South Atlantic, comparing compass readings and determination of north by astronomical observation and plotting them on a chart as isolines. By the 1760s, John Harrison's invention of an accurate marine chronometer had helped solve the issue of longitude. By the, by the beginning of the 19th century, it was widely understood that the Earth's magnetic field was continually changing over time in a complicated way that interfered with compass readings. From the 1820s, things started hotting up in terms of magnetic science. Prussian scientist Alexander von Humboldt began enticing other scientists and nations to his magnetic cause, with mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss, Willem Weber, and Edward Sabine in England, they set up what was called the Magnetic Union. And that's the, the three magnetic boys here. Uh, the union coordinated the taking of simultaneous readings at magnetic observatories scattered throughout the world. In 1818, Edward Sabine had travelled with John Ross on the Isabella in search of the elusive Northwest Passage. It, seem, it seems to cross, crop up quite a bit, the Northwest Passage, in this story. He gave Ross's nephew, um, 18-year-old James lessons in the science of magnetism. It was a fortuitous encounter. Lady Jane Franklin dubbed James Clark Ross the handsomest man in the British Navy, and I think she was right. Byronic good looks aside, he is one of the most impressive figures in our quest. By 1828, he was a seasoned Arctic explorer and took up his Uncle John's offer to sail to the Arctic once again in search of the Northwest Passage. They voyaged in a tiny paddle steamer called Victory, that not surprisingly became firmly wedged in the ice. It remained stuck for four years. Not one to twiddle his thumbs, the dashing JCR embarked on a number of sledging expeditions. Ross was convinced the North Magnetic Pole was in his grasp, and in May 1831, with three shipmates in tow, he set off taking meticulous dip readings as he went. Now in this picture you can see a dip circle in the corner, 
the dip circle is what we, these explorers and scientists used to help find the, the magnetic poles. It's essentially a compass on a vertical rather than horizontal plane. And when someone is near the magnetic pole, it, or on the magnetic pole, it dips vertically. This one was specifically designed for ships, um, so it could actually absorb the sort of rolling motion of a ship. It was called a fox dip circle. Um, <clears throat> on June the 1st, near a cluster of abandoned igloos, his dip circle recorded a reading of half a minute off the vertical. Nature, he wrote, had, ere had here erected no monument to denote the spot which she had chosen as the centre of one of her great and dark powers. While it was two years before the result was published, Ross had definitely, if temporarily, located one end of the Earth's magnetic axis. Scientific attention now shifted to the other. In the 1830s, using data from the global web of magnetic observatories, Carl Gauss was able to calculate the proximate position of the South Magnetic Pole, 66 degrees south, 146 degrees east. These coordinates proved tantalising to nations eager to expand their influence and demonstrate their scientific prowess. In the late 1830s, France, Britain and the United States mounted three great naval expeditions to explore the Antarctic. Each had the South Magnetic Pole as an objective. James Clark Ross, the leader of the British expedition, has it, had it as his goal. So imagine, Antarctic waters that had only seen a smattering of ships had now become a shipping hotspot. Rivalry, rivalry was bitter. When ships from the French expedition glimpsed those from the US amongst the fog and bergs in January 9, 1840, they tacked the other way. Neither nation would fess up to sour grapes. The Americans maintained they sighted first land on the morning of the very same day as the French, although they somehow omitted to record it in their logbooks. American Charles Wilkes generously supplied his British rival Ross with a chart of his voyages and aversions on display in the exhibition, detailing land which Ross later lightly sailed over. On returning to Hobart after their second Antarctic foray, the captain of the French ship Zélie thought the locals' congratulations had an edge. It was easy to detect the presence of considerable national jealousy, that our successes were causing some heart burning. Jules, this is, I'll just give you a little snapshot of each of the um, expedition leaders. Jules de Monteville was a veteran sailor whose previous experience in southern waters was searching for the remains of his ill-fated colleague La Perouse. In 1837, king, uh, the King of France charged him with voyaging as south, far south as possible, further than the sealer Weddell's 74 degrees south record of 1823. His two ships, Astrolabe and Zélie, made three forays into Antarctic waters, wintering in Hobart, where the ever-generous Governor John Franklin supplied him with convicts to lug his magnetic instrument to the top of Mount Wellington. In 1840, the voyage spotted land and claimed it for France, naming it Terra Adélie after the commander's wife. And the ships got trapped at one stage and spent about five days, they spent about five days trying to escape. This is what this image captures. The leader of the US exploring expedition, Charles Wilkes, was a rather dubious character who constantly courted controversy. Six ships set off in 1838, but only two survived his four-year expedition. He also made several forays into Antarctic waters, wintering in Sydney. Curious visitors, Australian visitors to the fleet, were appalled at the shoddy state of his ships. Wilkes recorded in his narrative, again on display in the exhibition, most of the visitors to the ships considered the whole expedition to be doomed to be frozen to death. Indeed, Wilkes' sanity was called into question. When he offered naturalists a chance to stay behind and meet ships in New Zealand in March 1840, they all gleefully accepted. The last ship of the wharf was James Clark Ross, who voyaged into Antarctica, Antarctic waters in the period 1839 to 1842. Erebus and Terror were ice-hardened ships, ex-bomb ships built to withstand the recall of mortars. After returning from the North Magnetic Pole, Ross had completed a magnetic survey of Britain. His instructions were to establish magnetic observatories from the South Atlantic to Tasmania and to reach the South Magnetic Pole. In Hobart, the magnetically minded Governor John Franklin employed convict labour to erect Ross Bank Observatory, pictured here. When Ross arrived in Hobart in 1840, he discovered to his shock that both the French and Americans had spent their second Antarctic seasons specifically seeking his baby, the South Magnetic Pole. Neither had managed to reach it. It lay much further south, it appeared, than Gauss predicted. 
Ross took advantage of his rival's information and plotted a course further east, which somehow makes sense. His three voyages into Antarctic waters were the most successful in terms of discovery. He discovered the vast Ross Sea, the best ocean access to the South Geographic Pole. He took possession of Victoria Land. He discovered two smoking volcanoes he named Erebus and Terra. He reached his furthest south, a record not surpassed for 50 years. But even with his fox dip circle, specially designed to take readings on the ship, the South Magnetic Pole eluded him. When he reached the Great Icy Barrier, renamed the Ross Ice Shelf, he acknowledged that his pole lay inland and we might with equal success, chance of success, try to sail through the cliffs of Dover as to penetrate such a mass. With a heavy heart, he was compelled to abandon, this is a quote, compelled to abandon the perhaps too ambitious hope I had so long cherished of being permitted to plant the flag of my country on both the magnetic poles of our globe. While none of the three nations could locate the magnetic pole, located at land rather than sea as predicted, they did have some pretty impressive consolation prizes. Dumont de Ville became the first to land on the Antarctic islands. Wilkes United States Exploring Expedition proved Antarctica was a continent. And James Clark Ross made lots of discoveries. While fascination with Antarctic history seems to hone in on the heroic era, those, the era of sledges, these expeditions took astounding risks, venturing into the ice pack with wooden sailing ships. Roald Amundsen, the man who reached the South Geographic Pole first, perhaps summed it up best. He said, these men sailed right into the heart of the pack. It is not merely difficult to grasp this, it is simply impossible. To us, who with the motion of a hand can set the screw going and wriggle out of the first difficulty we encounter. These men were heroes.